So one slide about Sierra. So we are a prototype fabricator and a production fabricator in the United States. We manufacture uh, quick turn cycle time uh, boards in our California facility, as well as do we do uh, assembly, surface mount assembly uh, with our pick and place uh, machines. Uh, so we're equal, equally a PCB fabricator and an assembly shop, and we have the capability to manufacture complex uh, class three space uh, circuit boards as well and, and do it quickly. I would say that's why we're different. So this is the quick table of contents that we, of what we'll be discussing today. And if there's something not here that you want to discuss, please ask the question uh, in the uh, uh, Q&A section. Uh, and we will either address it or get back to you after. So if you're building a class two board or doing a prototype um, that's for something that's gonna sit on your desk, um, then you know this webinar, is this webinar for you? And I would say the answer is yes, because you should know the differences between class two and class three, and you should know what you are not getting with the class two. And uh, maybe if you're early on in your company and in your project, you wanna take advantage of some of the class three reliability uh, that, you know, instead of just class two. So it's a, it's a good piece of knowledge to know regardless. But basically class three PCBs are PCBs that are, you know, need to be high, reli highly reliable. Um, they need to meet the spec for class uh, three. They're oftentimes military boards. They need to withstand harsh environments. They need to have long uh, lifespans. So those are the reasons for sure you would want a class three spec on your fabrication drawing. Um, and then, why is class three better than class two? So there are different materials that are selected because of class three. Um, there are um, more testings that happen in class three um, to make sure that the board is going to be able to meet any kind of um, longevity requirements. So uh, here are some IPC specs, uh, 6012 ES, um, is really uh, what we're seeing a lot of these days. And then there's a, a couple of other aspects as well. So this came up recently. If, you're, if your board's going into space, you have to be worried about outgassing. Uh, and then for Sierra Class 3 versus Class 3S, we really make the boards from pretty much the same way um, to handle the outgassing requirement. So you wanna always start off with choosing the right materials for your design. So that's not just electrical properties, it's also physical properties of the material. And one key thing is, you know, some materials are more prone uh, to the micro fractures or wicking than other materials. So if you have a space requirement, um, you know, talk to your fabricator to see what they suggest for that flavor or model of material that will minimize the wicking that can occur in the vias. Here are some of the other key considerations for um, picking your materials. <laughs> And then, of course, there's the uh, stack up. And so in the stack up creation, again, there's electrical requirements uh, as you know, for controlled impedance, high speed lines, you want to minimize your crosstalk EMI, um, you want to have good return paths, all those things are, are important for, um, you know, your stack up design, as well as, you know, keeping a, a minimum amount of dielectric thickness in between copper layers after press out. Um, the old uh, military spec said, you know, you need a minimum of two plies of prepreg. Um, that's, I, you don't need to put that in the fab drawing and the fabricator, you know, they would understand the spec and what's required. So you don't need to over specify 
specify that. But as I say in every webinar, talk to your fabricator about your stack up, uh, even before layout, especially if you have a complicated uh, class three design. And we'll be talking about some of the pitfalls uh, for, uh, right after this uh, stack up demo. We're doing a stack of them. Okay, good. Our PCD stack of designer tool uh, provides manufacturable and cost optimized stack ups and also includes an impedance calculator. The tool allows you to change the signal plane combination and the copper weights in the generated stack. Uh, first, you need to enter the board information, uh, like the PCB project name, for example, demo, a revision number, PCB size. Let us take a two by two PCB. You can use this drop down uh, to, uh, to choose a, or to select a PCB thickness. You can choose a PCB material from here, or you can also click on the material selector compare guide. Uh, so this guide allows you to view the data sheets of various materials and compare their attributes. For a rigid PCB type, uh, you after entering all this board information, you can uh, choose the uh, one of the listed approaches in the stack up design section. So you can choose the first option if you know the number of layers required in your design, or if you have a complex BGA that dictates the number of signal plane layers in your board, then you could go with the second option. Let us, for instance, choose the first option, select a layer count, and a signal plane layer combination. Click Run Stack Up Design Now. You will be presented with the Sierra Circuit's recommended stack ups. This table gives the stack up information like the signal plane layers, the HDI standard, or the number of sequential laminations, the PCB thickness, and the technology level and cost index. Uh, you can click on the help uh, guide uh, for a description of the corresponding parameter and the help content, for example, of this standard or HDI shows the illustrations of the standard and different HDI stack ups. The standard stack ups allows only through hole vias, whereas the HDI stack up allows blind and buried vias too. The technology level uh, for the stack up defines the drill size, pad size and trace width parameters that can be used. The features of the technology level are finer as you go from level one to level three. The cost index gives you a relative idea of what it would be compared to another stack up. You can use all of these information to choose a stack up that resembles your final build up. Click on report to view the stack up. Here on the report page, you can view the attributes without going back to the previous page. If you do any changes to the broad properties, Click on generate custom stack up to update. Scroll further down to see, to view the details, uh, to view a detailed stack up. Uh, here, it uh, here you can see the information of the stack up, like the materials, the layer type, the copper percentage, the finished thickness in mills, dielectric or copper waste thickness, the copper plating thickness, dielectric description, the dielectric constant, and the material construction details. We can change the uh, layer type here, for example, if I choose mixed, we can see that the copper percentage is automatically uh, adjusted. Uh, let me change layer six as well for a symmetrical stack up. Below the stack up, we have the Sierra circuits built in impedance calculator, which allows you to add control impedance and compute the trace width and trace spacing for a target impedance. To add the impedance, you can click on the plus symbol to add a fresh line. Uh, you can also go back to the stack up and click on the X symbol to remove the solder mask. Let us take a few examples for the impedance calculator. Uh, at signal one, for example, at a target impedance of 50 and a single ended model type, I'll choose the first reference line layer is two and the transmission line model is an uncoated microstrip single ended. Similarly, for a layer three, 
with a target impedance of 50 and uh, single ended select a reference model of 2 and the second reference model as a reference layer is 4 here we can see that the transmission line model is a strip line single ended you can click on calculate or calculate all impedance and this calculates the trace width the trace width the calculated impedance and the propagation delay uh, if you want to view more output parameters you can click on view which opens the in, uh, impedance calculator we can see that additional uh, output parameters like the inductance capacitance and the effective dielectric constant are displayed here uh, on scrolling further down, you can uh, see the technological param technology parameters and cost index and the VSET information. To save the stack ups, click on save and download the stack up in the IPC standard 2581. Clicking on save generates an ID that allows you to access the stack up in the next login sessions. If you click on export to IPC 2581, the stack up data is imported in a .xml file which can be implemented to any ECAD tool which supports IPC 2581. You can alternatively also use the second uh, stack up design method with the complex VGA. We start by adding the board details, the PCB size, the target PCB thickness, PCB material, and click on the second option. The recommended VGA patterns are displayed below. Here, enter the pins in the X1 direction, for example, 25, also in the Y direction, Y1 direction, and enter a VGA pitch, for instance, 0 0.8 mm. Uh, this shows how many number of traces can be routed between the edges and VGA pads and vias in different layers. Drill and pad sizes to be used under and outside VGA area are also shown. Click on the run stack up designer and follow the procedure same as earlier. The stack up suggested here will support your BG. You can click on the view saved stack ups to view previously saved stack ups. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Vandana. Uh, so going back to uh, the presentation, uh, let's see. Uh, some design considerations as well. Uh, before I jump into this, uh, someone was asking a question about um, class three design rules. We are definitely getting to that. Uh, and then, uh, there was a question about, you know, kind of your design rules around barrel plating. Just a quick answer. Um, so barrel, I mean, you can plate as much as you want in the barrels, um, as long as, you know, there's no component that's going to go inside of that. Um, so, yeah, no limitation on plating to the barrels. Uh, typically, you plate in the hole and on the surface, but in those cases, we would just plate in the vias itself. So here are some kind of design guidelines um, to minimize any sort of signal integrity issues. Uh, one thing that, I, that every board shop, I think, is getting better at because the machines are getting better is back drilling and having a very tight control of uh, back drilling. Uh, so, um, you know, in order to minimize line impedance discontinuities, you can use a daisy chain uh, routing technique um, to divide the loads into equal chains. Um, you can have tightly coupled differential pairs and, you know, you can, in order to avoid any sort of discontinuities caused by vias and via stubs, um, you know, you can use the back drilling type of a uh, strategy and it's not very expensive uh, because it's not adding extra lamination. Um, okay, so then uh, in order to, you know, another kind of to minimize signal reflections, uh, you want to incorporate uh, ground planes without the splits. 
Um, you can employ series termination resistors and place it near the source point. So a series termination, termination resistor should be placed within one sixth wavelength of the switching speed. And to minimize EMI, you can incorporate 3W uh, trace separation uh, as well as some shielding. And then to avoid crosstalk, you can place the connectors as close to the ground plane as possible. You can route the signals on different layers, keeping them orthogonal uh, to each other. And you can reduce para, uh, parallel runs uh, between signals. And then here are some heat dissipation techniques real quick. Um, so you can incorporate wide and heavy traces uh, for faster uh, heat dissipation. So we're comfortable, you know, up to, I would say four ounce copper. And then when you're getting into five and six ounce copper, I would say those are special boards with special requirements, very special requirements. Um, and you have to talk to your fabricator. So first things first, the stack up and the materials between the thick copper layers really matters uh, in order to uh, predict the press out and um, you know making sure that your drill sizes via sizes um, can handle all that you know drilling through all that copper you want to make sure they're as large as possible so there's all sorts of things that can happen um, when you have a heavy copper uh, requirement Uh, and then, uh, Vandana, did you want to do an impedance uh, demo? If you can keep it short, I think we're running out of time. Uh, so this is the impedance calculator. Uh, the Sierra circuit's impedance calculator uses the 2D numerical solution of Maxwell's equations uh, for PCB transmission lines and renders a fairly accurate result suitable for the circuit board manufacturing and engineering analysis. Uh, so here in this tool, we have 82 impedance models with the multiple geometries, such as a coated, uh, such as coated, uncoated, um, excuse me, I'll just, yeah, such as the uncoated, coated, embedded, strip line microstrip and with each specific uh, model you can choose single ended differential pair coplanar and uh, the others uh, so let us quickly start uh, with maybe a strip line model and a differential pair uh, you can see that there are other geometries available with composite dielectrics as well this is a basic model here and the geometry is shown on the image here. Uh, you can choose the units from the available dropdown. Let us go with mills for now. Uh, let us enter a dielectric height, for example, four, a dielectric constant, 3.84, a dielectric height of 6.416, and a dielectric constant, of 3.63. So here to calculate the trace width, you will have to enter the delta W values. Uh, delta W is nothing but the difference between the top of the trace and the bottom of the trace. You can click on the help button to display a table that suggests the delta W values uh, based on the starting copper weight. Uh, you can use it as a reference. Uh, let us take 0.5 for now a trace thickness of 0.7 mils and a trace separation of seven mils. Uh, you enter a target impedance, for example, 100 ohms and click on calculate W. This calculates the trace width, the impedances in the odd and the even mode, uh, the propagation delay in the odd and the even mode and the coupling coefficient. Uh, you can also instead uh, enter the trace width and calculate uh, the differential impedance. Click on the show more parameters. And you can see that the effective dielectric constant in the odd and even mode are displayed here along with the mutual and uh, trace inductances and capacitance. We can go ahead with the signal loss calculator. Here we enter the dissipation factor DF1 for example, 0.0, .0 
to 6 and uh, dissipation factor 2 0 0.0 to 5. Uh, let us take a frequency of 10 gigahertz, surface roughness of maybe 6 microns and 5 microns. Uh, this surface, uh, if you click on the help guide for the surface roughness, you can see that uh, for different uh, foil profiles, you can see various ranges of the roughness. Uh, let's enter a trace length of 2 inch and click on calculate loss. Uh, the signal loss outputs are the conductor loss, the dielectric loss, insertion loss, and the total insertion loss in the odd mode as well as the even mode. We can go ahead with the integrated crosstalk calculator. Maybe enter the coupled trace length. Uh, for example, or two, the signal rise time, that is 100 picoseconds maybe, and uh, signal voltage one, this is auto-filled here, but you can obviously change it if required and click on calculate crosstalk. The near end crosstalk and the far end crosstalk results are displayed here. Uh, the near end voltage, the saturation length, the far end voltage and the far end uh, crosstalk coefficient is also calculated and displayed. Let us go back to the slide now. Uh, thanks, Pandana. Okay, some important uh, DFEM checks. Uh, you want to reduce, uh, you know, sharp angles, 90 degree angles. Um, you know, that can cause all sorts of issues uh, during etching, um, like acid trap is definitely an issue. Um, also in your designs, uh, not specifically mentioned, but you don't want uh, any slivers um, due to, you um, the design which uh, could cause flaking um, during manufacturing process of the resist. So, you know, that would be something that would be flagged at the DFM stage, but if you can avoid it in your design and output stage, that would be even better. Uh, and then in terms of clearances, uh, you know, you want uh, enough clearance, the edge of the edge of the board, you know, for, a, for our routing, uh, our machines are getting really good. So I think it's a plus or minus two mil tolerance now on the routed features of a circuit board. Uh, and then, uh, you know, something like a drill to copper uh, is really important to know, you know, what the construction is of your board and what's the build strategy. So, um, you know, and that's true for annular ring as well. I'll discuss that in the annular ring slide. Uh, and then there's also something uh, I mentioned about the solder mask clearance. Um, solder mask defined pads um, is not necessary for good assembly and can cause, uh, it basically makes misregistration more obvious. It makes it a little bit harder to uh, get that accurate during piece of fabrication. So I don't recommend uh, solder mask defined pads. Here's some quick guidelines uh, as a designer to to help prevent respins, um, I'm gonna just breeze right through these. Um, and they're, they're in the slide and you can see the slides later as well. I think people are here for, you know, very specifically class three type of uh, d manufacturing rules. So for class three uh, in the VIA itself, that's the most important, um, Part of the board and class three uh, and class three space, you know, really you, you have to meet certain requirements uh, with the VIA. One of them is no voiding. So in a class three build, we put coupons um, on every panel, just like in a class two build, but we cross section coupons on every panel uh, and not just for the lot, which is in class two. So that's one big difference between class three and class two. If you're doing more sampling um, in class three, there's a higher chance you could find a void. And if you find any voids, that's not acceptable for class three. So that's one big difference between class two and class three. And then uh, here's some other quick comments. If you, know, if you have a via fill process, 
Um, you can have some, you know, exposed materials, um, you know, better to solder mask over uh, a filled via, or if you're going to be, you know, capping it with copper, um, that's okay. Then you wouldn't really have any uh, voids there. So in plating um, for um, class three, uh, you know, you there's something called a wrap requirement. And so you have to be aware of what those requirements are as a fabricator. And when we do a cross section of the VIA after manufacturing or during manufacturing and process inspection, we're looking to make sure we've done enough for that wrap requirement. So uh, wrap for um, a drill through hole is different than a wrap requirement um, for a laser drilled microvia filled with copper. I don't think there is a rock requirement for a laser drilled microvia uh, filled with copper. So really important is annular ring discussion. Um, so we like as much annular ring as possible. Um, if you're doing like an eight and 23, um, you know, that's plenty of annular ring. Um, if you do need to do something tighter, uh, you know, minimum, let's say five mil annular ring uh, would be, uh, you know, what we would want. But, you know, in terms of like where you're starting out in your design, um, start out as large as possible in your annular ring. And then if you're doing a complex stack up, which has sub constructions. So let's say, for example, you have two subs. You know, annular ring requirements, let's say on a through via going through both subs, um, would be more than, let's say, a six layer board annular ring requirement because you have to deal, the fabricator has to deal with the subs uh, moving around and the scaling of the subs. So at that stage, when you have a complex stack up, you should talk to your fabricator to see what it is that they can meet um, on that build uh, for that specific build strategy. And a lot of fabricators, um, you know, will post design rules on their website, uh, but those design rules, they really are uh, just a starting point. Design rules really play against each other while you're designing your board. Um, you know, multiple design rules will have a factor. So it's really critical that you talk to your fabricator at the stack up stage, even before routing your, your product. Let me see some of the Q&A questions. We can definitely get to these offline and or um, have some important things to talk about. I think another critical uh, comment um, is uh, the, the copper wrap requirement as it relates to via fill. So we do, you know, because of the class three copper wrap requirements, uh, we want to make sure we meet those. We would do uh, a panel plate, which adds a little bit more copper. That panel plate makes it harder to etch. So if you have a stack up that has a, a via fill process from let's say one to four, and you have a stack up that has uh, another via structure, let's say from one to six, and that also has a fill requirement. Now the outer layer is seeing more copper, more flash plates. And so you need to design your outer layer with that in mind. So it should be like, let's say a minimum of eight mil trace in space rather than doing something like a five mil trace in space. So a five mil trace in space obviously is fairly easy to manufacture, but when you have more plating, steps um, because of via fill on the outer layer, you could have issues. And this same issue can come up in subs. So knowing which, how your manufacturer is going to build your product and knowing which layer, which inner layer basically is going to be more like an outer layer in manufacturing. Those are all uh, really critical things. Uh, the top part of the slide talks about etchback. So a positive etchback is recommended for class three boards. It gives you that three point uh, connection to the inner layer of copper. 
And in a class two design, when you kind of clean the vias prior to plating, you could have a negative etch back, meaning the inner layer of copper is um, not completely protruding outside of the dielectric. Um, so the copper, inner layer of copper itself can get attacked, you know, with the whole wall cleaning and the prep and all of that. So um, some customers will specify no negative etch back and that's what they mean. Or in other words, you want a positive uh, etch back. And so if your board is a high reliability kind of situation and it's a class two board, you know, you can still specify positive etch back required and not incur, you know, all of the requirements for a class three board, but it would increase the reliability of your board. Let's see. Yeah, I think I said everything I wanted to on etch back, positive etch back and via fill. So for solder mask, um, there is solder mask allowed to go into the hole a little bit. Another thing you can do is you can plug. So a plug is literally a two-step uh, solder mask process where we'll first put a little bit of solder mask in the via, and then we'll uh, do solder mask over the whole via. So it won't be kind of like half on, half off. It'll just be completely covered with mask with the plug. Oh, sorry, I didn't mention the silk screen side. So silk screen should be, um, we use uh, no outgassing uh, silk screen uh, and we recommend uh, text height of 25 mils and line width of uh, four mils. In regards to the surface finish, uh, you know, it's really, I think surface finish depends on your application and your environment, but, you know, Enipig has shown to have better, um, let's say, adhesion of components to the board, as well as um, Enig and Enipig are good for uh, any large components, large BGAs uh, to maintain the, um, the flatness uh, for assembly. So if you have smaller components or tighter pitch components, I would go with uh, Enig or Enipig. You know, other factors for surface finish, of course, are yield and cost, um, you know, what kind of environment in terms of shock and uh, uh, pollutions. So moving on to uh, class three as it relates to assembly, there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, so, you know, uh, during your process of assembly manufacturing, you wanna make sure you meet those class three requirements like, um, you know, no um, visual defects really are allowed. The barrel fill has to meet the 75%. We can x-ray the barrels to make sure that that, is, that requirement is met. That's different for a class two board. So again, if you're in a high reliability environment, you can still specify these things on your assembly drawing, even though you don't need a full class three requirement. Uh, and then, you know, I would, even have a discussion with our assembly process engineers to make sure that the design of the plated through hole via is, you know, appropriate to that uh, component um, to help with um, the assembly process. So anything critical, you should always kind of talk to us ahead of time, and that's our that's the benefit we provide. We have lots of engineers who can talk to you talk you through these. Um, you know, issues or potential issues that you want to eliminate. Specifically, what kind of, um, you know, solder mask design you should have, uh, make sure that there's no chance or less chance of solder bridging, um, you know, making sure you have the right clearances. So clearances for PCB is one thing and clearances for assembly is another. Uh, so we run a DFM and a DFA, but prior to the design, 
you know, talk to us about that specific component. Um, if there are any kind of special concerns that you have. We do have a very detailed component placement guidelines in terms of spacing. Also, you have to consider flying probe test. Um, flying probe test is a critical part of the debugging process and the development process. It can really save you a lot of time. So you want to get make sure you get as much test coverage if you can. Uh, so that's uh, important for component placement. Um, going back to PCBs for a second, um, you know, we, we do a flying probe test on bare boards as well as assembled boards, and then we also do cross-section prior to assembly. And so cross-sections are really critical to make sure there's no cracks anywhere. Um, you don't want any voids in your vias, like I mentioned earlier. You want to make sure that you've properly plated um, your vias, you've gotten the positive etch back that you're looking for, you know, things like that. So all those are really important in the cross-section um, process of uh, manufacturing. So how does someone know that um, we have a good circuit board? So the cross-section, the in-process coupons, meeting the spec, um, Sending, uh, sending it to an outside lab. So oftentimes for class three or class three ES, we would send a set of coupons to the customer and then they would send it to their independent lab as well to cross verify basically. Um, and then uh, the other test that exists is the IST testing. So IST is um, very tough test, I would say. So it's basically a daisy chain. And if there's any failure in any of one via, you know, you're, it's gonna show up in the ISD testing. So IST is a very rigorous test, uh, but it can, you know, it's important and a lot of customers are uh, opting for that. Um, stack vias are not recommended along with IST testing. So a lot of the IST testing we've done in the past, that whenever there are stack vias, they do tend to fail um, more frequently. Uh, so uh, there's one slide on impedance testing. So just like uh, class two, class three coupons um, for reliability, and proper plating in the via, you also have impedance coupons to check for the right impedance values. And then here's the slide I mentioned on flying probe test. So flying probe test is, um, again, it checks for any opens, open traces, any shorts, um, any misplacements or poorly rotated components, just like AOI at assembly. Uh, and if you can provide uh, more test points, uh, the better. On the assembly side, um, and we also do automated optical inspection. And so AOI on the assembly side, um, you know, incorporates a high resolution camera. They can rotate it so they can see really if the, there's a proper uh, solder joint. We can save the pictures as well, but you'd have to ask your account manager to save the pictures. Uh, we don't save all the pictures of every solder joint unless you ask. Same with x-ray, we can save the pictures, but you have to ask for that. Um, and x-rays, uh, I mentioned earlier, x-rays are usually, anything that you can't see with the human eye are good for x-rays. So for example, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, making sure there's enough fill in a through hole component as well as you know anything under QFN or BGA. Um, you know, that's all good uh, for x-ray. Now something I kind of alluded to this throughout the webinar, if there's something that you don't need class three, but you still want something or you're particularly concerned about something about your design, you can come to an agreement with your fabricator. Um, and, you know, really kind of explain the note um, and you know, have a note that represents that on your uh, drawings as well. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have to be per spec exactly. So a lot of times 
customers will design to class three, but not everything can be maintained for class three design, like specifically certain annular rings. And so we're going to ask for a waiver to class two, which is totally fine as long as there's a good understanding between you and your fabricator that that's uh, you're okay and that's acceptable. Um, so just having that open dialogue um, with your fabricator is really important. Uh, so uh, those are the main uh, takeaways I'd like you to have for class three. There's also a class three design guide, which goes into a lot more detail on our website. If you haven't downloaded that already, um, you can take a look. Uh, I think the key thing is that and we have a bunch of knowledge base and uh, blogs as well. I think the key takeaway is if you have a complicated stack up, it just makes the, the board a little bit more difficult to build. And that's when even prior to layout, you should have a good relationship with your fabricator and discuss what are the uh, pros and cons, uh, both from an electrical perspective, as well as from a manufacturability perspective in order to hit your class uh, three requirements, be it a uh, wrap requirement or or breakout or no breakout requirements for annular ring or dielectric um, requirements between the layers. I mean, all these things, how you're gonna build the board really makes an impact uh, even before you uh, design. Uh, so that, that does it for the uh, webinar. I thank everyone uh, for your time. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Yes, and one last comment. If you uh, want to reach out to us, uh, we have a 800 number. You can also leave a message on our website, basically create a ticket uh, and you know make an appointment with one of our engineers. We'd be happy to review a design, ask, answer any uh, questions one-on-one, -on -one, anything like that. And check out our resources. Thank you guys. Have a great day.